On January 23, 1971, a small group of hunters found a cloth bag in the middle of the desert. They thought they had caught someone else's catch. When they opened it to see what was inside, they were shocked to find the dead body of a woman. In the years that followed, no one knew what would happen. Who was this woman, and why was she murdered? Let's look at 52-year-old Jane Doe, who was finally found in 2023. Let's start right away to look into the Mojave case. Jane Doe was a victim whose name was kept secret for 50 years before it was finally given back to her. It is the second biggest county in Arizona. When the Great Depression began, Mojave County began to lose its reputation as a place to dig for gold. Miners and soldiers used it as a holiday spot. People loved the national parks and used the area as a quick way to get to the Grand Canyon. But on January 23, 1971, a mysterious murder happened in Mojave County. The sheriff's office is still trying to figure out what happened. In a remote part of Mojave County, Arizona, three hunters were on the lookout for animals. They found a cloth bag in the desert with the words deer pack in it. The bag was left in the desert along Hackberry Gravel Road. It was tied loosely with a white cotton line. They opened the bag to see what was inside because they thought it might be a dead animal left behind by another group of hunters. When they found the twisted body of a woman, they were shocked and terrified. When the police were called, they closed off the area right away so they could start their investigation. Investigators knew that the person who killed the victim was trying to cover up the crime. There was nothing there. Near the crime area, no IDs, bags, or purses were found. Investigators sent her body to the Mojave County Coroner's Office for an autopsy while they kept asking the shooters about any strange behavior in the area. From the beginning, it was clear that the woman had been killed because the person who did it didn't leave any signs and got away. At first, no one knew what caused her death because there were no signs of injuries from a fall or gunshot wounds. There were also no signs of a health-related death, like a stroke or heart attack, and the toxicology results said that her insides were healthy. But because she was in a cloth sack, it was hard to tell if there were any marks on her neck from being tied down. She wore a long-sleeved black cardigan, a blouse with five brass buttons down the front, and burnt orange stretch pants with the words Symphony is what's happening stitched inside. She wore half-size black leather pixie boots and bobby socks that may have been white at one point. People said that her hair was done in a studio style and that she looked clean and put together. Her pedicure was neat and even, but what really stood out was how hard she had worked on her teeth. Her nails were clean and looked good. She was missing two teeth and had a bridge made of porcelain that cost about $2,100. Detectives worked hard on the case, but they never figured out who she really was. The cops put an ad in the local papers with a sketch of the woman, but it didn't lead to any possible leads. Then, they tried other ways to find out who the person was, like talking to customers at nearby places that cater to people from the upper middle class and checking out clothing shop. They also looked at airplane passenger lists and put an ad for a lost person in a magazine for dentists. Still, none of these efforts turned up any solid clues. Missing person signs were put up in Arizona, California, Nevada, and Utah as the search for the person grew. During that time, 23 women went missing, but none of them fit the description of the Mojav Jane Doe. As part of their search for possible criminals in the shooting community, investigators talked to almost 5,000 people who had applied for hunting licenses during that season. They thought the murder was a mama-papa killing, which means it was done by a husband who was mad at his wife. Still. This did not lead to anything good. No matter how hard they tried, they couldn't figure out who the Mojave Jane Doe was. She was buried in Kingman's Mountain View Cemetery. On her simple tombstone, it says Jane Doe and the date she died, 
January 29, 1971. Thirty years later, in 2001, a special investigation unit agent was asked to find out who Mojave Jane Du was. The special investigations unit was created by the Mojave County Sheriff's Office in 1999 to look into, solve, and close cold cases. The case of Mojave Woman Doe was the oldest of almost 60 unsolved cases that year. Miller and her team did a careful study, just like the ones that had come before them. Miller and the other agents went through old case files and notes. They talked to witnesses again to help them remember more and maybe find more clues. They sent in their fingerprints and teeth records again, but nothing worked. Miller and her team also asked an artist from the Museum of Northern Arizona to make a composite of Jane Doe using photos of her head taken after she died. They thought that the new artist would be able to show off the victim's best traits in a more professional way that might attract someone who knew her. Again, they used national media to talk about the case, hoping that after 30 years, one of Jane Doe's children or family members would come forward. No luck again. Miller's team also looked for links to Deer Pack Ames Harris Neville and company the company that made the victims sack, but they had been bought out. Miller and her group looked into the case again after 20 years. They looked at files and checked out all tips. The only person who could help was Jane Doe. Miller's team tried to find the brand of clothes the victim was wearing, but it was no longer made. The case was added to the NAMIS database in November 2021, but no results were found. Again, detectives had used up all leads. The sheriff's office changed their Facebook post about people who were missing or couldn't be found because they were looking into the case. In October 2021, 51 years after the Mojave Jane Doe was found, a Texas-based investigative family group called Othram, Inc. reached out to them. On Facebook, the company said that it would make a family tree using Jane Doe's DNA information and geneticists' new DNA technology. The new technology was very expensive and took a long time to make. Before that, Investigators posted the sketch again on their Facebook page, trying to find out more, but nothing happened. Miller and her group saw only one option. She said that genetic background was the only way to find out who she was. People on the study team really cared about it. She might have been missed as a wife, daughter, or mother, even though there were no findings. The proof was turned in. The Mojave Jane Doe case was their way to give peace to the family and victims who couldn't speak for themselves. The scientists decided on genetic testing after praying about it. The sheriff's office gave $1,000 to test. Miller said that even though the county was big, there weren't many people living there, wasn't much money. But other groups set up a donation website to get the last $6,500 needed to start testing, hoping that the community will open its heart to give the Mojave Jane Doe her respect back. The DNA Solves page called Dear Gladys helped bring in money. After making the page, the rest of the money was raised within five days, and testing could begin. First, Mojave Jane Doe had to be dug up by the detectives. In November 2022, when the Mojave County Court said it was okay, the grave spot was dug up. Even though the bones were old and in bad shape, experts were able to get enough DNA to test. The body had to be moved because a thrum wasn't ready to be tried. A long process and some new tools. People started to believe in DNA genealogy testing after the Golden State Killer was caught after 40 years. Investigators used current DNA testing and forensic-grade genome sequencing to make a DNA profile. Then, this description was compared to those on websites about ancestry. These websites have accounts of hundreds of people who have given DNA samples to find and keep track of their family members around the world. Based on the DNA of Mojave Jane Doe, 
many family trees were made. The family trees were something that investigators looked at for a long time. By getting rid of people one by one, they were able to find a few distant relatives and the cousins who lived closest to them. They found someone in the family who was willing to give a new DNA sample. The good effects were proven three months later. The call lead detective Lori Miller had been waiting for came on January 23, 2023, 52 years after the Mojave Jane Doe was found. Each of them got a name. Colleen Audrey Rice was found to be Jane Doe after 50 years. The rest of Colleen's family already knew before the Mojave County Sheriff's Office shared on Facebook Monday afternoon. Colleen was born to James C. Rice and Flossie Truitt on March 17, 1931. Her family lives in eastern Kentucky, but she is from Portsmouth, Ohio. Her brothers are a secret. Colleen went to Portsmouth High School, but in 1946, when she was only 15, she married William Davis. Investigators looked at her old school papers and found a picture of her in a yearbook, which they added to her case file. At 39, Colleen would have died. No one knew anything about her. Colleen's family lived far away, so investigators didn't find out much about them. Colleen had grown apart from her husband and family. She looked like she was about to give birth, but there was no way to find her children or make sure she did. Colleen's absence made her forget everything she knew about her. The study into how Colleen got to Arizona also came to nothing. When Colleen's body was found, it was clean and in good shape. The cops wanted to know if she had changed her name to start a new life away from her family, but no one in Kingman could remember her. After the investigation, all of the formal steps were taken so that her family could bury her. Her body was dug up in February 2023 and taken to Ohio to be buried with her family. In their oldest case, the person who had been hurt was finally found. It was a relief to learn the name of the person who had died. Kristen Middleman, the chief development officer at Othram Inks, said that it is encouraging to see law officials and the public work together to find out who a woman who died 50 years ago was. The case was important to the people who worked on it. They thought that Colleen had earned a good death Lori Miller, who was in charge of looking into the cold case, put the composite sketch on her computer so she would remember every day who they were fighting for and why. Miller said that the victim used to be called Jane Doe, but now that she had a name, it made her sad. She also said that finding people who were still alive at the time of the event was one of the team's biggest issues. Wow. 13 News found Colleen's long-lost cousin. Colleen's grandfather on her mom's side is Eli Allen. He is from Ohio. Allen knew they were linked when he heard about the case and saw the victim's name. When he saw Rice, which was from his mother's family, he knew they were linked. After 50 years, he and other people found Colleen. Investigators are trying to find out who killed her and left her body where it was found. At the exam, there was no alien DNA, so an attack cannot have happened. Colleen went away on her own, so she wasn't killed. During the 50-year search, no one who knew her seemed interested in finding her, since no missing person report was filed. The way she died did not help the cops figure out what serial killers have in common. Even though Colleen was found, the case is still open. We tell stories like Colleen's to show how hard detectives work and how amazing technological improvements are making it possible to solve cases that many people thought could never be solved. In October of 1989, after a month-long trial, Jacobs is found not guilty. Kenneth Kenny Kuntz visited his family's house on July 5 like any other day, but was shocked to find his entire family shot and lying on the floor, bleeding. He quickly called the police, 
but despite weeks of investigation, the killer remained unidentified, leaving the community in a state of shock and confusion. In October 1989, after a month-long hearing, Jacobs was acquitted of the murder of the 55-year-old Kuntz. Byrne is in the middle of Wisconsin and is part of the Wausau metropolitan area. In the year 2000, there were only 562 people living in Bern. People live in the town at a rate of 16.5 per square mile. Bern is a quiet town with a lot of national parks, parks, and golf courses. It's a great place to raise a family because of this. At least, this is what the Kuntz family thought when they lived here. Helen Kuntz, her son Kenneth, Randy Kuntz, and Helen's brothers Clarence Kuntz, Irene Kuntz, and Mary Kuntz were all part of the Quince family. The people in the area knew that the family was very close. Some thought they were too close together, six miles from Burntown Center. The family lived in a gray house that was coming apart on 108 acres of land. People who had been to the family home and farm said it was full of things and crowded. Since the house didn't have indoor water, the family used a wood-burning fire to cook and keep warm. The only Kuntz who didn't live in the crowded house was Kenneth. Kenneth chose to live in a caravan next to the house so he could have some peace. The Kuntz were not poor, even though their house looked old and worn. Between the two of them, they had been able to hide more than $20,000 in cash around the house. People thought the Kuntz was kind of weird. They always paid their bills in cash and didn't like to talk to other people. Most of the clothes in the family had been passed down from one person to the next. It looked like they were very close. Kenneth and Randy would often drive their mum, Helen, into town so she could buy food and pay the rent. Kuntz were treated like strangers in their own town. Some people in town were nicer to the Kuntz. But most people thought they were strange and weird. The Kuntz would have been forgotten if it hadn't been for a windy evening on July 4th. E. On July 5, 1987, Kenneth woke up in his camper and grabbed his head. He spent the night at the cheese factory, where he used to work before going out with his friends for drinks. Kenneth had a few more beers than usual on July 4 and went to a party, which he regretted when he woke up the next day. After taking care of his business and getting ready for the day, Kenneth carefully walked from his wagon to the main house. He thought his mother, uncle, and aunts would be there to greet him. Instead, he saw something that would always be with him. When the front door, springs squeaked, Kenneth called out to his mother, but she didn't answer. He shut the door and called her name over and over. As he walked down the hall a few more steps, he stopped in shock. His Aunt Marie had been shot in the head with a .22 caliber gun and was lying in a pool of blood on the floor. Kenneth walked around his house in a daze, hoping this was all just a bad dream he would soon wake up from. When he got to the kitchen, Randy had been shot and left to die in a pool of blood. Kenneth went over to him and tried to revive him, but it was too late. Kenneth knew he had to find the rest of his family so he started carefully moving from room to room. At this point, Kenneth didn't know if the bad guy was still in the house, and he was scared that the same thing could happen to him. When he got to Clarence and Irene's rooms, he found both of them dead. They also shot with a gun size of 22. Clarence was in his room when he saw Irene slouched in a chair. Kenneth knew that his family had been caught off guard by the attack, and had not had time to react or run away. Kenneth ran down the stairs and out the door, feeling sick to his stomach. He ran over to his next-door neighbor's house and banged on the door. Kenneth asked to use their phone in a lot of different ways when someone finally opened the door. Panic and fear took over Kenneth's body, and adrenaline rushed through his blood. He was finally able to get in touch with his friend, and his neighbor called 911. Within minutes, dozens of police cars circled the 108-acre humble Kuntz farm with flashing lights and blaring horns. After finding out what was going on, investigators started their investigation. 
Kenneth was the first person the sheriff's office tried to talk to. He was the only one who wasn't hurt, and he was the one who found the bodies of his family. During the first talk, Kenneth said that he couldn't find his mother Helen Kuntz anywhere in the house. Even though Kenneth was worried about his mother, the agents couldn't help but think she was up to something. At the beginning of the investigation, detectives didn't know why the crime happened, so they were open to all options. In a July 1987 UPI story, police in Marathon County said that they won't know if Helen Kuntz is a victim or a suspect until they find her. Would Helen really have a reason to kill everyone in her family except for her son? After that... Could she have killed herself? She might have been able to change her name and leave. Officials had to put these important questions on hold while they worked hard to figure out what had happened on July 4th night. Investigators were sure that whoever killed the Kuntz didn't know that there was a lot of cash around. Taking into account inflation, $20,000 would be worth more than $52,000 right now. Even though the family was poor and lived in a bad place, they had a TV and a video player. The town heard a story that spread like wildfire, which made the family stand out even more. Gail Wheeler, the owner of a local hardware shop, told the Marathon County Police that Helen bought some bullets from his store in the weeks before the murder. Helen said that her sons Randy and Keith shot birds on the big family farm with the bullet. However, that wasn't the most interesting thing she said. Gail told the cops that Helen had told them that her family watched dirty movies on the VCR. This was shown to be true by the fact that sexy books were found in the Kuntz family home. Worryingly, this wasn't the first time that the family had heard stories of strange sexual behavior and incest. In Marathon County, investigators found a case file from the 1930s. A friend who was 40 years old was accused of beating Helen, who was 15, and getting her pregnant. The friend was found guilty by the court. Kenneth also thought that Helen's brother, Clarence Kuntz, was his real father. It's not clear how true these claims are, but Helen's family, especially her mother, has always said they are not true. As time went on and the rumor mill kept going, more and more stories came to light. People in Bern thought that Helen and her son Randy shared a bed at night, which added to the reports that they were in love. It was also said that Clarence, Marie, and Irene, who were all boys, slept together in the living room. People in the town had heard about incest for a long time, and now they were wondering if these relationships had come to a head. People kept making guesses. Helen, on the other hand, could not be found anywhere. Even though they were far away, the people of Bern supported Kenneth Kuntz. The family was weird, and there were reports that they did horrible things. The killing still hurt the people in the town. People asked, where is Helen? There were t-shirts, buttons, and signs when Helen went missing. They also asked for help and kept a close eye out for any sign of her. Investigators knew that Helen had been seen at a fireworks show in Athens, Wisconsin, on July 4, 1987, the day before the slang. Kenneth didn't know where his mother went because he was at work and then at the bar. As summer turned into fall, People started talking about whether a 70-year-old woman who was five feet, three inches tall, could kill her whole family. People in the town of Bern stopped thinking about the Kuhn's family, and life went back to normal. Detectives kept looking for Helen and the person who killed almost all of her family while this was going on. But as the story got more complicated, the cops found a strange turn. In April 1988, nine months after she was killed, Helen's body was found in a ditch in Taylor County, Wisconsin. She, like the rest of her family, had been shot in the head with a .22 caliber bullet. When Helen's body was found, 
an autopsy was done. But any new information that was found had never been made public. But for a while, the case didn't go anywhere because Helen, who was thought to be the killer, ended up dying the same way the rest of her family did. Surprisingly, the murder in 1987 wasn't the first time the Kuhn's family had been through a tragedy like this. In December 1905, Mary Kuntz, Helen's grandmother, was found dead in her home in Manitouk, Wisconsin. But he was short. The results were shocking. Mary's son, Wenzel Kuntz, was blamed for killing her. Wenzel killed his mother while she was sleeping in a club. Her body was found by the rest of the family. Wenzel was sent to a mental hospital after his hearing showed that he was crazy. His brother also happened to be a patient at the same place. By 1906, a lot of people in the Kuntz family had died. In 1914, the people who were still alive went to Marathon County to start a new life on a farm that was supposed to be full of food. But when they got there, they found out they had been told a lie. They were told there would be fields, but all they found was a wasteland with dead trees and old food. Byrne and Marathon County finally heard about the Kuntz, but it was hard for detectives to figure out why they did what they did. Since more than $20,000 was found in the home, it couldn't have been because someone stole it. The story was already strange, but in January 1988, it got even stranger. The police found new signs that helped them figure out who the suspect was. Christopher Jacobs was the man. He lived in Athens, Wisconsin, which is close to Bern. Investigators found out that Christopher, who was 22 years old, had bought a car from the Kuntz right before they were killed. He was one of the few people who had ever met the Kuntz. People avoided them because they thought they were weird or had heard stories about them. They never met anyone else because they lived alone. Investigators thought it was strange that Christopher knew this strange family, so they started to look into it. Investigators searched his Medford property and found a car, 2.22 caliber rifles, 22 caliber ammunition, spent shell casings, and newspaper stories about the murders of the Kuntz family. After a forensic study of the car found on Christopher's land, it was thought that the tracks found at the Kuntz crime scene were made by the same car. A request sent to the Wisconsin Court of Appeals said that police had made plaster casts of tire tracks and footprints in the area around the Kuntz home and in their yard, which is about a quarter of a mile away. In January 1988, Police looked for Christopher Jacobs' car to see if the tracks found in the Kuntz yard could have been made by its tires. Christopher was caught in January 1988, but he wasn't charged with anything until a few days later. Even worse, authorities had a hard time finding proof because he was free to roam around for months without a care in the world. Christopher didn't see the Marathon County Sheriff's Office again until August 1988. He was caught and charged with the same crime a second time. Also, he was told that the case would be brought to court. Then, in August 1988, Jacobs was accused of being involved in five killings. The study into his arrest was one of the longest in Marathon County. Christopher Jacobs woke up in jail on a hot August morning. It took him some time to get used to being told when and where to eat, sleep, and go. Christopher kept saying that he wasn't guilty and got a lawyer to help him. Christopher's lawyers knew that most of the evidence against him was inferred. The lawyers for Christopher worked on their case for months. In October 1989, the case went to court. Crocker Stevenson, a writer for the Milwaukee Journal, had been following the case closely. When the court dates were made public, he made sure to get a seat in the front row. He later told the Post Crescent they put a suit on Christopher and cut his hair, but he was a thug 
and he came from a family that saw the Kuntz as someone they could take advantage of. Because Bern and Marathon County are so close, a jury from nearby Brown County was brought in to make sure Christopher got a fair trial. For weeks, the proof was given. There was a close look at the study and cross-examination of witnesses and experts. A long video of the crime scene was shown to the judges. Most of them couldn't stand to see on TV how dead and hurt the Kuntz family was. They got sick from it. The judges saw tire marks on the crime scene and on Christopher's car. They also heard that he was one of the few people who had talked to the family. The rest of the Kuntz family and their friends held their breath as the jury made their choice. Christopher Jacobs is facing a long sentence for killing almost an entire family. But after only ten hours of discussion, the jury found him not guilty of all charges. There were screams and yells in the hall right away. Christopher let out a loud sigh. He was finally free. After the ruling on October 28, 1989, Christopher was let out of jail. But that didn't last for long. In 1993, Christopher's ex-girlfriend, Stacy Weiss, brought up this strange and weird case again. She went to the sheriff's office in Marathon County and asked to talk to Lieutenant Randall, Onish in particular. Lieutenant Onish hit the play button on the tape player and looked at Stacy in shock as she spoke. Stacy told Lieutenant Onish that she and Christopher went on a date in 1991 and that Christopher told her that he killed the Kuntz family. Christopher said that he did it to prove to himself that he was a man. Stacy said that Christopher met Randy Kuntz at the Kuntz home on the evening of July 4, 1987. Randy and Christopher got along well after Christopher bought a car from him. Randy was glad when Christopher moved in with him. Stacy says that the two got into a fight quickly and that Christopher then pulled out a .22 caliber gun and shot Randy. Christopher then planned a way to go around the house and shoot the rest of the family in the head. Christopher tied Helen up and took her to a swamp, where he shot her and left her body. No one can figure out why he did it. Christopher was scared when his ex-girlfriend told him she was just a jealous lover out for revenge. The Marathon County Sheriff's Office believed what Stacy said, so Christopher was caught again. This time, Christopher was accused of taking Helen Kuntz hostage and killing her. Christopher Jacobs wouldn't go to court for five years. So agents were glad they moved quickly. Reports say that Christopher was caught for the second time just a few hours before the time limit was about to run out. On June 8, 1998, Christopher Jacobs went to court again to find out what would happen to him. Christopher's luck ran out, and after only four hours of talking, he was found guilty of kidnapping Helen Kantz and keeping her in a fake jail. Christopher Jacobs was sentenced to 31 years in prison. He won't be able to get out until February 2020. On February 4, 2020, Christopher Jacobs, who was 53 years old at the time, was released from the Columbia Correction Institution. On February 5, 2020, Christopher was taken back to the Marathon County Jail. This was a strange turn of events. Strangely, he had put himself back in jail by telling agents that he didn't want parole and would rather finish his sentence at the Columbia Correction Institution. But he still told the media that he was innocent and that the police had forced his ex-girlfriend Stacy to lie about his supposed statement. According to a statement made to the Wasso Daily Herald, there are suspicions that Marathon County may be attempting to frame the individual on false charges in order to conceal their wrongful imprisonment in the past. The individual further claimed that they were informed to leave Wisconsin after being cleared of all charges in 1989 as the police were allegedly seeking retribution against them. In June 2020, Christopher Jacobs went back to jail. He decided to stay there for the last 14 months of his time, 
Many folks in Bern don't believe that Christopher killed the Kuntz family. The most likely reason is that a family member did it. But since everyone but one of them has died, it's unlikely that we'll ever know the truth. It was a mystery in southwest Minnesota for 41 years. Who was the man murdered and dumped in a culvert near Beaver Creek? On October 19, 2004, a 28-year-old mother named Keisha Brown was found dead in her home in Las Vegas. Her body was hurt and had been raped. The police didn't have much proof and couldn't find anyone who might have done it. Even after the case was over, the police never forgot about Keisha. A few years later, the search for her killer began again, and DNA testing helped shed new light on the case. So who was this evil killer, and why did they do it? Hi, and welcome back to our channel. We are always creating exciting content for our viewers, and we would love for you to be a part of it. Let's look at the situation with Keisha Brown. Las Vegas is a place where things are always happening. It is home to more people than anywhere else in Nevada. Because of its famous casinos, world-class entertainment, and never-ending nightlife, this desert oasis has become a place where people go to have fun and thrills. But behind all the glitz and glam is a fascinating history, from when gangsters and showgirls ran the city where which is the entertainment heart of the world. A terrible murder is being looked into in this interesting city. Keisha was born in the 1970s, but we don't know a lot about her life. We don't know much about her youth because we don't know of her parents' names, where she went to school, or if she had any brothers. But one thing is for sure, in 2004, she was a young mother who lived in a small house on the busy East Flamingo Road. She was very proud of her daughter Kalia, and she would do anything to help her have a better life. It's also not clear what Keisha did for a living, but it's clear that she was a strong woman who didn't let life get her down. At the time, Keisha was also dating a man who was only known as her boyfriend. No one knows what his connection to Kalia was. People who knew Keisha will always remember what went on on Tuesday, October 19, 2004. On that day, people saw a red car driven by someone they didn't know pull up in front of her apartment. No one knew who he was or what he wanted, but he didn't wait and went right into Keisha's fat. It's not clear where Keisha's daughter was at the time, but she wasn't in the room and was safe somewhere else. The man was inside for a few minutes, and when he finally came out, he was holding a rucksack. He quickly ran back to his car, started the engine, and sped off into the night, leaving rumors in his wake. People who later saw him said he was black and had a big body. Seven minutes before seven o'clock, Keisha's boyfriend made his way to her room eager to see his beloved. But when he knocked on the door, no one answered. He frowned and tried to turn the handle. To his surprise, it was easy to turn. When he opened the door to his room, he had the feeling that something bad was about to happen. He called out for Keisha, but there was no answer. His voice filled the empty flat. But he didn't hear back, and that made him even more worried. As time went on, he looked for the flat by going from room to room. In the bathroom, he found her still lying in the tub, hidden under a pile of clothes. With a start, he realized that something was very wrong. As he got closer, he could see that she wasn't moving, and he could also tell that she wasn't breathing. He could also see from the blood on her that she had been stabbed. He tried to find a heartbeat but couldn't. When Keisha's boyfriend saw how bad things were, his heart started beating faster. He knew he had to move quickly if he wanted to save her, so he sounded the alarm. As soon as it happened, worried neighbors started coming into the room. When people heard the noise, the next few minutes were a blur of chaos and confusion as many people called the emergency line quickly to tell what had happened. As they waited for help, it seemed like time stopped. The event was reported to the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department at 7.13 p.m., and they rushed to the flat right away. When help arrived, they were helped, but it was too late. No one could help Keisha. Her body was taken carefully out of the room and to a place where it could be looked at. 
When the cops got to the crime scene, they knew they had a lot of work to do. They carefully collected DNA evidence from the scene and put it away because they thought it might be the answer to the mystery. They also started to ask Keisha's boyfriend and anyone else who might have seen or heard something. During one of these questions, they found out that a strange man in a red car had been seen going to Keisha's flat. From what people who had seen him said, the cops couldn't shake the feeling that this man had something to do with Keisha's death, but they didn't know much about how he looked. No one had been able to get a good look at him, and there were no security cams to help them figure out who he was. But the police didn't give up. They went all over the neighborhood, knocked on doors, and talked to anyone who might know something. They knew that any piece of information, no matter how small, could be the key to solving the case. The results of Keisha's autopsy came out quickly, and to say the least, they were upsetting. The Clark County Coroner's Office, which did the autopsy, found that she was choked, which was a very cruel way to die. But that wasn't all. Keisha had been hit, stabbed, and kicked before she died, according to the autopsy. When people heard the news, they were shocked, and they tried to understand how bad the crime was. The cops kept looking for the person who did this, and they didn't stop until they found the person who did it. As the police worked hard day and night to solve the case, they couldn't help but wonder who the strange man was and what he knew about Keisha's untimely death. Even though they tried hard, they could not figure out what was going on. Keisha's family was left to grieve and try to figure out who killed her so cruelly. As time went on, the case went cold. In August 2022, the mysterious murder of Keisha was given a second chance when it was given to the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department's cold case unit. The department decided to look into the case again and put some of its most experienced officers on it. As the team started looking into the details of the case, Detective Dan Long found a new hint that had been missed before. He noticed a pattern that he had seen in some of the cases he had looked into in 2005. Detective Dan had worked on a case before where three young women were killed on different days and had nothing to do with each other. The three women were killed the same way and their bodies were left in the same place. Norman Flowers did all three acts, and he is now in jail for the rest of his life for each of them. When Norman was a thief, he did terrible things and got hurt. During the first few months of 2005, he broke into homes and attacked people with violence on a regular basis. Shayla Qualls, who was 18, was the daughter of the woman he used to date. She was the first person who had been killed by him, that anyone knew about. Norman had been in jail for 10 years and had been let out twice. About 20 days after he got out of jail for the last time, Sheila was killed. On March 24, 2005, he broke into Sheila's flat and beat her up badly in the bathroom. He hurt her badly with his fists and then choked her to death. To make things worse, he left her body in the hot tub with her face up. He ran away after taking her cell phone, bank card, and jewelry. Over the next few weeks, Norman became a helpful ex-boyfriend. He even told Deborah that she should see a therapist because she was so sad. She didn't know that the monster who killed her daughter was standing right in front of her. On May 4, 2005, more than a month after the first attack, Norman did it again. This time, in just eight hours, he went after not just one, but two women. First, he broke into the flat of a 45-year-old woman called Merrily Coot, who had bad luck meeting a bad person. Norman hit her with a stick, beat her up, and then choked her to death. But there was more for him to do. He went to Rina Gonzalez's 25-year-old flat and stayed there for a while as the night went on. Rina, like Merrily before her, couldn't defend herself against Norman's blow because it hit so hard. Someone hurt her and put a phone cord around her neck to choke her. A few days later, the police talked to Norman, but he said he had nothing to do with the horrible killings. But the physical evidence was more powerful than his lies. The DNA they found on Marilee's body helped the police find him. On June 6, 2005, he was caught and charged with killing Marilee. 
That was the end of his terror rule. The cops were able to link Norman to the deaths of Sheila and Rena because there was a lot of evidence against him. In 2008, Norman went to court because he killed Sheila. Norman's family asked the judges to spare his life because the prosecutors wanted to put him to death. They said that when Norman was a child, he was beaten and raped, which left him traumatized and afraid. Even though Norman's family said he wasn't guilty, the judges found him guilty and sentenced him to life in prison without the chance of parole. For killing Marilee and Rena, he got two more sentences of life in jail in August 2011. As Detective Dan read about Norman's terrible actions, his heart was beating fast. Deep down, he thought this man had something to do with Keisha's death, which had never been solved. He knew that he needed hard evidence to make an arrest, and DNA testing was the only way to make sure that what he thought was true. Detective Dan quickly put together a package with the proof from Keisha's case and sent it to the DNA lab. He couldn't wait to hear what happened. After all these years, he was still determined to make Keisha's family happy. No names have been given for the pieces of proof that were sent to be checked. Detective Dan and his team got more and more worried as the days turned into weeks. They knew that finding Keisha's killer was important for both justice and their own peace of mind. They finally got the call they had been waiting for on December 21, 2002. Because the data were clear, it was easy to see what needed to be done. Norman's DNA matched the DNA from Keisha's case. After looking for him for years, they finally found him. They couldn't believe he had been right in front of them the whole time. It was also clear from the evidence that Keisha was Norman's first victim. After this, the agents started to think of ways to bring Norman to justice for the killings. He was serving three life sentences at the High Desert State Prison in Nevada, so they didn't have to look for him. On February 23, 2023, the agent gave the order to arrest Norman. The charges were very serious and included murder with a deadly weapon, sexual assault with a deadly weapon, and theft with a deadly weapon. No matter what or where Norman was, the police were determined to find him and make him pay for what he had done to Keisha. As soon as the news got out that Norman had been taken into custody, the police held a meeting the same day. The family Keisha was asked to come, and when Keisha's daughter Kalia came, she had a sad heart and was crying. She thanked the police for making her feel like her life could go on. The sad thing about Keisha's death is that it shows how dangerous our neighborhoods can be. Even though Keisha's death was very sad, her family and friends were soothed by the fact that Detective Dan and his team never gave up trying to find the truth. But the case also raises questions about what's wrong with our legal system and why we need better ways to keep people from getting hurt and help those who have. Let's look at another case of Nancy Misiva. Nancy Mitevers, whose given name was Pepper, died in her home in the Durham neighborhood of Washington County, Oregon, on January 2, 1983. It was a cold morning in the middle of winter. She had turned 28. No one thought anything was wrong, so they thought she had killed herself. People thought that Nancy had killed herself, so the case went cold while Nancy's family tried to deal with her death. After 40 years, new information changed everything about the case. Oregon has 36 counties, and Washington County is the second most famous one. It is in the Portland City area and has the second most people. People like living in Washington County, Oregon, because it is away from busy places and has beautiful scenery and a lot of greenery. The best things about this place are the beautiful hills and mountains, the friendly people, and the old houses. About 600,000 people live there, which makes it the most populated county in the state of Washington in the United States. It has a lot of places to hike and walk through wildlife and fish, and the culture is very interesting. People can go there to get away from the stress of daily life. But it also has some dark secrets which is where our case takes place. Nancy Mitevers, whose last name was Pepper before she got married, was born in Oregon in 1955. 
the mother of Nancy, Lenore Papa, is now 97 years old. She was used to people saying that her daughter was sweet and pretty. Everyone who knew her or who met her for the first time said she was a nice person. Nancy was very fond of both of her sisters. She was the third child, so both her older sister Janet Aglidis and her younger sister Diane Grill loved her. She helped her mum and sisters talk to each other a lot. People liked to talk to her and spend time with her because she was kind, loving, friendly, and open. She was always the most loving of her sisters, and she had a strong desire to be a mother. She loved being a mom when she got married to Randall Randy Mansevers and had a son. One thing about her was clear to everyone. She loved being a mum. The early hopes of the sisters came true because Nancy cared about both her own child and her sisters. All three sisters thought they would raise their kids together. It was just a chance that the three sisters all had their first children within 18 months of each other. The plan was already in motion to raise them in a happy, close-knit family, but in a sad turn of events, it would not be completed. It was a cold morning in Oregon's beautiful Washington County on January 2, 1983. At 10.38 a.m., Randall Metsevers called the police to say he was lost. Randall seemed very sad that his wife had killed herself. In the Durham neighborhood, deputies from the Washington County Sheriff's Office went to the 17,000 300 block of Southwest Rivendell Drive. At the time, Durham was not part of Washington County. In 1983, it did join the county. A shooting wound to the head was found on the body of Nancy Metevers, formerly Pepper. Police were able to find her body with the help of the Oregon State Police Medical Examiner's Office, the Oregon State Police Crime Lab, and the Washington County Medical Examiner's Office. Even though Nancy's wound was very bad and her chances of living were very low, people ran to get her to a nearby hospital. She was almost immediately said to be dead. At first glance, it appeared that Nancy Metsevers had killed herself. At the scene of the crime, the cops found a Smith & Wesson handgun and took it. Inconsistencies didn't show up until the police started asking people questions. Only Nancy, her 30-year-old husband, and their one-year-old son were at home when the claimed suicide happened. The crime scene made the police wonder if the suicide happened in a closed area or if Randall saw it happen. The next asking made alarm bells go off. The police had to wait for forensic reports before they could move forward with the case. The case of Nancy Metevers, formerly Pepper, was much more difficult than the police had thought when they got the reports back. As soon as the autopsy report forensic tests, and ballistic tests came back. The officers knew there was something else going on. Medical reports from the Oregon State Police Crime Lab soon showed that it could not have been a suicide. Way too many things went wrong. If someone just shot a gun, there will be gunpowder on their hands and clothes. This can be checked by taking a sample and running it through a machine to see if there are any melted lead, antimony, or barium bits. The first thing that didn't make sense was that Nancy's hands didn't have any gunshot powder on them, but that didn't prove anything directly. This is because the substance can only be found six to eight hours after the shot was fired, and it can be easily washed away if it comes in contact with other things. So, it wasn't enough, even though it was a big find. The second thing that didn't make sense was when the doctors said that Nancy's cup was too big for it to have been a suicide. The cut was bigger the farther away the barrel of the gun was from the person. The report also said that the burned bits on Nancy's clothes showed that she was fighting or trying to protect herself. Nancy, her husband Randall, and their one-year-old child were home alone. Randall didn't say that anyone else was there or that someone had broken in, so it was only natural that the cops found their main suspect. The officers asked Randall the first question. After telling them the facts, he said that he and Nancy had been fighting over the gun and that he couldn't remember who had pulled the trigger because of all the chaos. When the cops kept asking the same questions, Randall took back what he had said, changed the story, and told the officers the new version. He told the police that Nancy had just pulled the gun when he walked into the room. 
Randall walked in and saw what was going on, but it was too late for her to fight back. Already, she had shot herself. Both of these things were the exact opposite of each other. Finding out what really happened was important. So, the agents talked to people who knew Nancy well, like her family, friends, and co-workers. Everyone thought Randall was somehow responsible for her death. Just a few more pieces of evidence were needed for the cops to figure out what was going on and make a strong case against Nancy's husband. So, two days after the first time they talked to Randall, the police asked him to come back in. They tried to get him to talk, but he wouldn't. Then Randall's parents went to the police station and told the officers that their son was ready to take a polygraph test to prove that he was innocent. But Randall did not show up for the planned test. By April, he wasn't helping the police at all anymore. The police said that the reported suicide of Nancy Msevers was a cold case because they had no new information or leads. A week after Nancy's funeral, her family was told that the fears of foul play had not gone away and that there were no new leads in the case. So the family did what they could to put this sad time behind them. After she died in 1983, the son and the rest of her family missed out on all the love she could have given them. What they heard really upset them. Nancy was such an important part of their lives that when she died, they were changed forever. When Nancy's family heard she had died, they couldn't believe it. She was a happy, relaxed person who loved being a mother in every way. Her family couldn't believe that Nancy had shot herself while her son was still in the house. She would never have done something like this that would have taken her so far away from her son. Lenore Pepper, Nancy's mother, didn't believe that her daughter had died. She thought Randall was up to something, but she couldn't say what. Lenore Pepper stopped worrying when the police said there was no proof of crime. She had already lost her daughter. Even though Randall wasn't in jail, he had to take care of his on-year-old kid. Lenore didn't want to do something that would lead to a problem she couldn't handle. She was worried about Randall and had a lot of questions about him. But she didn't say anything to protect him in case she was wrong about her fears and questions. Everyone who knew Nancy thought it couldn't have been a suicide but they didn't know for sure until the cops said it was. Nancy's sister thought it was a bad mistake that should never have happened. She died when she was only 28 years old. All of her hopes, dreams, and happiness vanished in an instant. No one thought the cops would look into Nancy McEver's case again because it had been closed for so long. In August 2022, the Violent Crimes Unit was in charge of the cold case probes. When they looked at the case file for Nancy Mitivas, they knew they had to do the right thing. No one even knew that Nancy hadn't killed herself. She had been murdered. The police looked over the proof they had already found before moving on. Detective Anil Sarek, who was part of the team that was looking into the case, said that it wasn't well looked into. In the 1980s, police work wasn't very good, and since the agent in charge in 1983 had already died, there was no way to find out why the case hadn't been solved for so long. The Washington County Sheriff's Office's Forensic Science Unit looked at the data from 1983 again, and the results were the same as before. The idea that Nancy could have killed herself was completely ruled out. Now, the police thought that domestic abuse might have led to Nancy Mkeva's death. Investigators didn't tell anyone about the new leads they were following because they didn't want to invade the family's privacy. The cops talked to about 20 people. Some of them were deputies, police, firefighters, and family members who were at the scene in 1983 or had a lot to do with the case. Even after 40 years, Nancy's story was still interesting. As more evidence came out, it was clear. After all these years, Nancy's file said that when police talked to people who knew her and Randall, they learned that he had planned to kill her because she wanted a divorce and to leave him. Anil Sarek, one of the people looking into the case, was surprised that nothing was done in the 1980s, even though there was clear evidence. He said, I don't know why they did what they did, but everything was starting to make sense, and Randall was becoming the most likely person to have killed Nancy M. Sievers. Randy was living in Tigard, 
an Oregon city 10 miles south of Portland at the time. In January 2023, the cops went to his house and asked him about what happened. He told the officers that hypnotherapy had helped him forget everything about that day. Now that the police had enough clues, and because they wanted Nancy's family to have a real sense of closure, they gave the case to the district attorney's office in Washington County to look into. The information that Nancy's family had been using for the past 40 years was wrong. Even though the Nancy McTevers case had already had a lot of turns, the police were shocked to learn that Randall had killed himself on February 8, 2023. He also wrote a note saying that he had nothing to do with Nancy's death. He also wrote a note on February 8, 2023, in which he claimed that he had anything to do with Nancy's death. Even though the DA's office couldn't look into the case anymore after Randall died, the cops thought that this was enough to put an end to it. Since their main suspect has died, Nancy McKeever's case is now over. When the cops called Lenore in August 2022, it was a surprise. She couldn't believe that what she had been thinking about the death of her daughter was right all along. Lenore, Nancy's mother, thanked the police officers for staying with the case until the end. She wished Nancy's father was still alive so he could see the end of their daughter's story. When Lenore Papa heard that Randall had killed himself, she said, I feel like we got justice, but in a very strange way. At my age, I don't think I could have gone to a trial every day, so we just have to accept that. Everyone loved Nancy, so when people heard that she had been killed in a terrible way, they felt a lot of different things. Her sister said that they felt every feeling all over again, but the whole family thought that Randall's suicide was as much proof as his trial in court. He said he had nothing to do with Nancy's death, but when he killed himself, Nancy's family finally accepted it. Things have been hard for 40 years. Now that we know the answers, her sister said, we need to finish it so we can move on. Nancy's family is telling more of her loved ones about what happened, and they are planning a funeral for her. After they got over the shock of finding out 40 years later that their beloved Nancy had been killed, they felt new sadness and trauma. But Nancy's whole family is thankful that after 40 years, Nancy finally got justice because of the investigation team. The people who loved Nancy thought she had killed herself. They didn't know it at the time, but their first questions about her death were right and led them right to the answer. Nancy's husband had killed her. Think Randall might have killed his wife. Why do you think that the cops didn't have a good case against Randall in the 1980s? Use the comments part to tell us what you think. Stay safe until the next time, and thanks for watching.